Hi, welcome to episode 61 of the American Tributaries podcast, where to break out of the bubbles we've all been living in. We're using modern technology to explore the various currents of people in our great country, kind of like a 21st century Lewis and Clark journey. I'm your host, Michael Whitten, here in Brooklyn, New York, and thank you for joining me in this exploration of America. Today, I'm so very thrilled to be joined by Mary Ellen Fury Hank. Mary Ellen is a patent attorney who lives outside of Philadelphia with her family, but more importantly, at least for me, um, she and I have been friends since it must be like our freshman year of college at the University of Pennsylvania. Mary Ellen, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you doing? And could you share a bit of your story? Yeah, great. Thanks for having me, Michael. Um, I can't believe it's been so long um, that I've known you. I feel like it's been yesterday, but um, uh, you and Christy and I go back a long time. Um, and one of the things I've liked about your podcast um, is that uh, so many of the faces have been familiar and I get to see, you know, different um, how, how different people have explored um, and, and lived their life. So that was kind of um, exciting to see people that we knew uh, way back when. Um, so for, for my story, I guess uh, you said I'm a patent attorney and uh, live outside of Philadelphia. Um, let's see. I, well, I grew up very close to where I live now. Um, and um, I went with you to Penn and um, then worked as an engineer for a while and then went back to law school. So um, that was kind of, um, you know, a a fun time. And um, when I got into law school, I thought I was going to do environmental law and um, didn't really love it uh, during my classes there. And for summer jobs, someone said, uh, you have an engineering degree. You worked as an engineer. Why don't you try patent law? And I did, and I haven't looked back. (laughs) So, um, that was, um, sort of professionally how that went, um, worked for a very, very large international firm for, um, quite a number of years and then left and had my own firm for a little bit by myself. Then I worked for an IP boutique and then the boutique, boutique got absorbed into um, a a fairly reasonable size firm, uh, Vori, Sater, Seymour, and Pease, um, which is um, based in the Midwest and Washington, D.C. So um, then just um, personally uh, married and uh, married a guy who um, is from Pennsylvania, but not from around Philadelphia. And we have two boys um, who are 11 and 14. So busy times. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I can only <laughs> imagine. Um, has your family, uh, have you, so have you, I, I think when I was thinking of like, you know, people to, to have used the podcast selfishly as an excuse to like kind of reconnect, I was thinking like, you know, I've been trying to get out to other parts of the country. So, I, you know, talking to somebody from Idaho or Montana, Wyoming, et cetera, is for me eye opening. And then I was starting to look at like closer to home and I was like, you know, who do I know from Pennsylvania? And I was like, I think. Mary Ellen, I think she's lived. Have you lived? Have you have you lived your entire life within Pennsylvania? Uh, well, I mean, I've done a lot of traveling. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, but just nationally, internationally, and, yeah. um, and I worked in England for a little bit. Um, but by and large, yeah, I've been um, pretty close to home, either Philadelphia or outside of Philadelphia. Uh, and does your family have roots in in the area as well? Going back. Yeah, so this was an intentional decision on my part. Um, I grew up um, part of a very large family, um, large extended family, um, and um, we all pretty much, almost, almost all live in the Phil- lived in the Philadelphia area. Um, and you know, it was sort of it, it was very intentional that when I looked at what I wanted to do when I grew up, I wanted to be close to my family, um, and I'm fortunate that. Um, the rest of my siblings and, and parents are still generally around um, in, in the general area. And, uh, you know, it was very much a, I want to stay here. I had opportunities other places, but, um, you know, family was, was really important. And I, I um, love to travel, love to see the country, love to see the world, but I want to be, you know, near family. Yeah, yeah. Um, did, you, did you, do I remember, like, did you go to Russia at some point? I did. Yes. Okay. You have a good wow. memory. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So one of the, one of the great things about going to Penn was that there were all these um, unique opportunities. And I know you had some experiences as well, different from mine. Um, 
But one of the really uh, unique opportunities was this was, gosh, I'm trying to think. It must have been 1992. Um, Penn had the first exchange program um, with Moscow State University um, with really any Russian um, uh, college. And so um, they sent I think there were probably about 15 of us um, to Russia for about a month. Um, and we got to know the students at Moscow State University. The idea was that they were then going to come back our senior year um, and, and visit us. But unfortunately, um, economics and politics being what they were, they were not able to come uh, over to visit us. Um, but it was an amazing experience because time, um, well, the wall had come down while we were um, in college and um, we were really the first, I guess we were the second class. My brother was the year before he had gone and um, then I went and um, we were really the first Americans um, who had been there, um, you know, in, you know, since, since, you know. Uh, the USSR was really um, started. So it was it was eye opening um, at the time. I think you'll probably appreciate this, Michael, but I don't know that people who are younger will. At the time, you know, we all could see bits and pieces of what the news showed of as Russia. And it looked you know, well developed. It looked, um, you know, not like America, but not um, completely disparate from America in terms of development and beautiful buildings and, um, you know, nice roads. And obviously we'd see their military parades. But what we didn't realize was, is that all of that was basically um, done for the camera. And anywhere that the camera wasn't allowed, which was pretty much the rest of the rest of Moscow, um, you know, aside from a couple streets, and the rest of Russia was very poor, very under, underdeveloped, um, crammed into houses, crammed into apartments, um, way, way behind where America was. Um, and I actually, I, I think that's kind of very interesting because um, it really makes you appreciate everything you have um, to the point where we were told, well, there's a number of things you need to bring on the trip, um, one of which was toilet paper. Um, you know, this was supposed to be, you know, our, our enemy make us tremble, you know, up until a few years before we left or before we went. Um, and gosh, you know, toilet paper. And I mean, that was, you know, even in the nice places, you had to bring your own toilet paper. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, and I, a couple of things I remember is we were um, provided most meals and every meal, breakfast, lunch and dinner we had there we had cucumbers, every meal. And every lunch and dinner, we had cabbage, every one. And they were the only two vegetables we saw. And I think, you know, that was just what they had. And there was a glut of it. And, um, you know, you didn't get variety. You got, you got whatever they had if you were lucky. We were lucky. Um, you know, we were given the creme de la creme tour, and that was what we had. So, um, you know, I think it, it's... Um, kind of shaped a little bit of how I think about things, you know, um, and I know, don't want to get too much into the politics here, but um, when we were in the pandemic and I was doing the grocery shopping and I remember going into the store and, you know, I was like, well, what do I buy? Because there's no toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, there's no what I planned to you know, make for dinner. <laughs> uh, there's, you know, empty shelves. And um, I actually got in the car I was by myself and I cried. And I, I just, I sat in the car and I thought, I can't let my family see this. This is, you know, we're, they're upset enough already. Everybody in America is upset. Mm -hmm. But I've never seen this except in the Soviet Union. And this is, this is awful. And, and it really, really shook me. I thought, boy, we've got to, uh, we've got to do something because this is not what America is about. <laughs> and this is not what I want our country to be like. Um, and so that was kind of a very, like, I, I would just remember sitting there and thinking, gosh, I've never seen this ever, um, except in the Soviet Union. Um, so, I mean, I'm really glad I went. It was an amazing trip and we saw amazing stuff and, learned a lot. And uh, I made a, a good friend who actually did come and visit later. Um, and I'm still in touch with um, 
you know, him. Uh, but, you know, it, it is, um, it, it really shaped a lot of, of what I think about in terms of, you know, socialism and whether it works and it doesn't, um, in my point of view. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and seeing, you know, it, it, I had my 21st birthday there. And um, I have to tell you, it was really funny. The Americans were telling the Russians, you know, well, we've got, we've got to have a party. And I didn't know this. So they, they were putting together the party and, um, they were very generous and had this party and they had music and dancing and they got up, all the Russians got up and started doing all these dances and all the Americans are looking at them like, Oh my gosh, wow. They're really good dancers. And the music was American music, but the, it was American music from the sixties and they all knew how to do all these dances because they thought that's how we danced. And we had no clue how to do these dances. I learned how to do the hustle <laughs> because that's what they learned. You know, they're like, what do you mean? You're American. These are your dances. And we're like, no, they might be our parents' dances, but they're not ours. Um, and that just showed you, you know, how little they knew of us as well. You know, here they thought this is how American kids, you know, in the 90s, what they listened to and what they danced to. And we had no idea it was what our parents had, had listened to and danced to. Yeah. Um, you know, so it was a very um, a culture shock, you know, very different um, ways of, of seeing the world. Um, and, you know, it was, I, I left, I remember they told us to bring snacks and things. And uh, when I left, I had brought raisins and like granola bars and stuff. And I gave them to my friends and it was like gold. I mean, they were so excited to get these little things, you know, that, um, you know, gosh, you don't even think if you go and buy a box of raisins, you know, what's that at the time, less than 50 cents, you know? Um, and it was, it was just like, oh my gosh, she gave me a box of raisins. Wow. They didn't see that. Um, so, you know, it, it, I do think it has, it has really shaped a lot of how I view the world um, in terms of. Um, you know, what do we want? How do we get our country to where we want? What do we not want? Um, and, and some of the incentives that we saw, um, there were, so I was at one of the premier universities there, Moscow State University. And it was interesting to see, to talk with the students because they very definitely had a socialist point of view when it came to grades. Um, and, you know, you and I, we had an exam, we'd work our tail off, right? <laughs> we'd be in the library for weeks. Yeah. Um, and they would have an exam the next day. They'd be like, it's fine. Eh, we're all, you know, I'm going to get the job I'm going to get. I'm going to get the degree. Yeah. If it takes five years. It takes eight years, whatever, you know. And then they'll send, they'll send me where they want to send me. Didn't matter to them whether they got A's. Didn't matter to them whether they graduated on time or they graduated first in their class because it wasn't going to affect their their life. Yeah, why, yeah, why do the work? Why do the work if everybody else is going to get the same grade and, never, and they're just going to tell you where your job was? Um, and I often wonder now that there's some capitalistic, you know, um, uh, parts of, of the – um, of Russia. I often wonder if those people, you know, look back and regret, you know, gosh, presumably now, <laughs> you know, it matters whether you're a good engineer or a bad engineer. <laughs> um, but maybe not. I don't know. I, I um, but it made me, I, I definitely, it's, I always say that to my kids. I'm like, you know, you got to earn what, what you get. You, you don't just get it. And, and while, you know, it may seem great that everybody gets what, you know, what is allotted to them, it does result in a disincentive to work hard. Yeah. You know, well, you know, the, the my experience, because uh, I went to, I was in Moscow and I went to St. Petersburg in 2001 for like three weeks. It was a, like a, it's like a, I guess an intern, when I was interning at my law firm, um, uh, I got a chance to go to there. And I, ref, I think back to my experience and I'm sure, and I guess in the, in the, nine years or 10, nine years that I had elapsed that there probably have been some changes. But I refer to that when I go around the city sometimes, because I, to me, I think one of the things that's, I think, so, I think, I think one of the things that I think can be a bit uh, 
discouraging in terms of like, I don't know, the national mindset or um, the prevailing kind of like ethos is that, you know, that some like if you look at all the products that kind of come out, there's always like new little bells and whistles and look, we're doing this and we're doing that. And sometimes you look and you're like, God, like we're wasting so much time trying to like, you know, come up with like little things and, you know, why do we hype these up? But then I think about it and I'm like, you know, the, 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 the issue is like maybe in the short term, some of that stuff might seem frivolous or whatever, but like over time, you're going to get, I would think like you're getting an improvement and stuff, right? Like you're not, this isn't like the, the government, as much as you might want to say, this is a kind of frivolous and maybe we should be focusing on other things. I think that what you want is people to kind of unleash their potential on whatever it is that interests them. So right. collectively, we're better off if people are wor- trying to come up with any kind of new thing. But I do think that what I would say is I think that what I wish I saw more, a little bit more of maybe is some more maybe appreciation for being part of a collective. Like instead of, like I don't necessarily disagree with some of the notions of like, we should do this or we should do that. I think though it should be coming more from like yourself. Like it's not a, the government, like the the fact that college tuition is astronomical is a problem, but that's not just the fix isn't or isn't just, oh, the government needs to fix it. Maybe we need to take some responsibility for it. Maybe it's just the market needs to stop going to those schools. Or maybe we, if you're a donor and you're giving millions of dollars to Penn, you should say it should go towards tuition reduction instead of a brand new building. Like, I don't know what it is, but I, I think it's it, it, definitely the experience in Russia colors how I look at things for sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think, well, two thoughts to, to what you were just saying. I mean, um, so I think you're right. You know, um, sometimes you look at the bells and whistles and you're like, oh, my gosh, you know, really? <laughs> is that that big of a deal? Um, but as a patent attorney, you know, I one of the things I love about what I do is I talk to people and all day long, they're talking about what they did to improve something. And whether or not it's something that, you know, is um, deep intrinsic value, you know, is it a new drug um, to cure cancer? Or is it, you know, a new horn on your car that, you know, maybe somebody who is two can hear as opposed to someone who's 92, or I I don't know, something, you know, making these things up. Um, But, you know, I, I think innovation in and of itself is very, very important in a society. And a a society that doesn't reward that um, has a problem. So I think whether or not you want to, you know, obviously there are going to be some trivial improvements, right? But the market should bear that, right? So if the market doesn't care about your trivial improvement, you probably won't make a lot of money on it. Um, But, you know, when you think about it, some things that you might initially have thought was a trivial improvement may surprise you, may not be trivial to other people. Um, yeah. You know, things, you know, that are just kind of amazing. And and I think... Um, the airplane. I was talking to right. my son about, like, the wings of an airplane. I was like, you know, the key thing was just understanding the Vernoulli effect, where it's like, you just need to change the shape of the wing, and all of a sudden you can fly. And that's a tiny right. little improvement that is revolutionary. So I didn't mean to interject into what you're right, saying. Right, right, right. No, the- absolutely. I agree. But I, I think, you know, to, to your second point, you know... Um, I think often people see a problem, like you were saying, you know, college tuition, which is, you know, out of hand, and immediately think it has to be solved by the government. And I think that that is not going to benefit us in the long run and kind of a relatively new phenomenon when you think of our country and whether. I don't think people think about, gosh, you know, should this be solved in another way? Um, You know, uh, welfare state versus, you know, does some other institution step up? You know, are there other um, philanthropists out there? Are there other ways to support that? Um, You know, yes, there are going to be people who are going to need help. But the question becomes, is it that we want the government doing that? Or do we want to provide a situation where other, maybe better options could come up? 
Um, and I think, you know, right now, an awful lot of answers are just immediate. Oh, the government should do that. The government should do that. The government should do that. Whereas, you know, sometimes, um, maybe a lot of times, it might be better solved in another situation, another way. Um, you know, setting up, maybe the government needs to provide the appropriate environment, you know, maybe economically, politically, whatever, for certain things to be addressed. But I think you're right, you know, the market, we have market forces in this country. And and if if you don't think your college tuition is going to pay off, maybe you don't go to that college. Um, and I think we are seeing, you know, after the pandemic, there are a lot of colleges that maybe weren't in the, you know, top, top, top that aren't fielding the number of students that they used to um, and are, are maybe not going to make it. Um, and maybe, you know, that's, it sounds cruel, um, but maybe that's, you know, supply and demand and, you know, the result of capitalism, right? If, if it's not going to be worthwhile monetarily, and there are many more, you know, things to consider besides monetary, but let's just say, you know, for sake of argument, if you're not going to make enough money to cover your college loans for the rest of your life, then maybe that's not the right choice. You know, right. um, you know, there might be other considerations there for you particularly, but I think for most people, they're going to say, gosh, you know, if I know I'm never going to be able to pay for this, then, you know, if the government's not covering it, if you're covering it, you might make a different choice. Yeah. 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 You know, the, the other thing that you mentioned that uh, I guess is one of these that I refer back to is in trying to, in my mind, in trying to understand, like, I guess, how we got to where we are now. Like, and, and to me, you know, I would just say, I guess it's, it's really been like the last like six, seven, eight years, I'd say since like the, you know, the lead up to the 26 election, where it's just been like, I feel like I've been kind of like knocked all over the place and kind of forced me to do some introspection. But when I think about it, I really think that it goes back to like us and our, our time in college. And I think that's where like the world changed in a way that I think we haven't yet corrected to, I think maybe what was, I don't say an overreaction, but I think the pendulum shift swung too far over to a different side. And, and I think in that, I mean, like, you know, first the Berlin wall like fell in the beginning of our college. Um, time, you know, the whole world opened up to us, like us, literally like us coming out of college. It was our class year as kids in college when we were there, where all of a sudden it was like, you go anywhere, you could go to Africa, you go to China, you could go to Russia. The whole world was our oyster. Like literally it was our oyster. On top of that, technology, which was an area that, you know, you, you know, engineering, like that whole thing was just in its infancy, right? And it was exploding. And I think that the way I look at things and this is where I think it's not necessarily a political thing. It's just like human evolution or at least American revolu ev evolution is that I think our attention swung too far overseas. And I think that the technology kind of like was like the fuel on the fire to allow us to interconnect because you were able to do business deals with anybody anywhere and you could look at numbers. And at least the way I look at things, is I feel like we, the people who I think I think we, sometimes we got too distracted by paying attention to things beyond our borders and have and need to be reminded of like the people that we share the same land and same air and same waterways and same political infrastructure with. Um, well, you know, I think I think that's interesting, Mike. I think um, Michael, sorry, <laughs> going back to <laughs> going back to college here. <laughs> um, you know, I think that's an interesting way of looking at it. I guess I, you know, I think there are a couple of things. One, um, you know, you and I were in a wonderful place um, when we were in college and coming out. You know, we were set to, you know, take over the world, so to speak. And we were able to, you know, after college, we, you know, went and traveled. And pretty much almost everyone I can think of who was in our class took advantage of that too. But I think there's, that was a pretty unusual group of people. Um, and, you know, and many people, A, didn't, you know, have the desire or B, didn't have the means to, to do that. Um, so I think you and I see it maybe different than, differently than a lot of places, you know, a lot of people in a lot of places. Um, you know, my perspective, and it sounds like yours, was very definitely shaped by what we saw in other places, for better or for worse. You know, hey, look, I know I don't want to live in the Soviet Union. 
no way, no how, didn't see any benefit to it. Um, you know, I learned a lot from it. I was really glad I went, um, but no way do I want to go back to that. But I think there are an awful lot of people who didn't see that firsthand, who see what is filtered to, um, to you know, their own view. And, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, when, when we were in high school, I mean, at least in Philadelphia, there were at least two or three daily papers, right? Newspapers. Um, and they competed against each other and everybody read them. Um, you know, and if you didn't, you know, what did you see what was on the front page of the Inquirer? Did you see what happened in, you know, in the bulletin or whatever? And one of the benefits and one of the curses, I think, of technology is, is that um, we've become so... Uh, it's so easy for us to kind of get into our own way of thinking. And, you know, you start searching for things on the internet or you start looking at certain websites or you start listening to certain cable news or whatever. And it becomes very, very targeted to one side, you know, very, very, you know, you get one side of the issue, but they don't tell you it's one side of the issue, right? right. They act like, well, anybody else who would think anything else must be crazy. And I feel like that is something that has happened definitely, you know, since, since we were in college and beyond, um, because, you know, now we don't have to pay for, you know, the, the one or two or three newspapers in town. You can get unlimited, you know, information. But what people, I think a lot of people don't realize is, is there's often a very, very heavy bias. Um, and even if you agree with the side that you are reading, it would behoove you, no matter who you are, to go and actively seek out the other side um, and read about what the other side thinks, um, because that's the only way we're going to get better. Yeah. And if we're only in, you know, I only read these websites, I only look at these cable news channels, I only you know, this is my news feed in the morning that's curated for me because they know I like to read X, Y, and Z. They never show me A, B, and C um, is just going to, you know, exacerbate the chasm. Um, so I, I guess I look at it as, you know, the world is our oyster even now in that, look, we've got the technology. We've got the borders largely open. If you can't travel, you can find a lot online about different things. Um, but, you know, I'm seeing it with my kids in middle school. You know, look, you know, what's your source? Is it Wikipedia? Anybody can put anything on Wikipedia, right? Yeah. Um, and that's sort of, you know, the, the, the prototypical example. But, you know, is it all on one side of things? Is it all, you know, did you actively try to find out the opposite point of view? Because there is an opposite point of view. Whether you like it or not, there is an opposite point of view. And if you don't know it, don't understand it, don't see what they're thinking, um, you you can't get better. You can't yeah. learn. You can't think. You can't, um, you know, I, I was reading an article the other day about debating clubs and um, debating clubs in high school. And there were so many rules that the kids ultimately can't really debate. They're not allowed to say certain things. They're not allowed to make certain arguments. and I mean, that's the antithesis of a, a debating club, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, a debating club, I mean, when I was in high school, you, one time you had to argue pro and one time you had to argue con. It didn't matter what you really believed. You had to come up with the arguments and you had to convince them. And the judges knew that, right? They knew that you personally were not saying, I believe pro or I believe con. You're making the best argument you can make for that proposition on that side um and you're better for it you know so to kind of have a mind control or a thought control or a, a voice speech control um in a club like that is doing a disservice to you know people learning civics people learning you know how how to um process and make your own decisions yeah it's the it's the mental gymnastics, um, right. you know, and and I think like you know for me one of the the 
the uh, the quotes that really resonated for me from like To Kill a Mockingbird is like you never really know a man until or I think it, he says man, but you never really know a person until you've kind of stepped into their skin. Um, and another one I like to refer to is S. Scott Fitzgerald, who said, like, the mark of a first rate mind is the ability to hold two different, two opposing thoughts in your mind at the same time and still be able to function, essentially. And I think right. that that's one of the things that we, I, I think we're actually just being challenged. I think with technology and like for humanity is you've got to be able to step in those other shoes, even if you don't agree with it, to be able to step in those shoes would, I think, at least let you not demonize people. And right. it lets you to have a more productive conversation right. if you can have that mental agility to be able to say, oh, okay, this is why people feel this way. And I think in that respect, I blame, you know, the I guess the incentives within the media and within politicians who they don't present nuance. Like the only me the only people we, politicians we hear about are the extremes on the left or the right. That's what gets that's the clickbait and that's what gets reinforced. All the the quiet guy people working in the middle who are just trying to be productive get don't get the press and to the extent that you make compromises like all of a sudden like you'll see you know it's like the, the debt ceiling compromise all of a sudden there's this little group of like republicans who are angry at uh, you know speaker mccarthy and there's a bunch of like people on the left who are angry with biden like they only go to those extremes and to be moderate or to be more nuanced in how you look at things and more realistic is is kind of like denigrated and you know it only proves to be proves to be fodder for the media to then build on the extremism or encourage it. Right. Right. I absolutely agree with that. And, you know, it, uh, another thing that's really changed since we were in college was, um, you know, when I was growing up, people didn't tell you generally which side they were on. Yeah. I remember asking my parents <laughs> and they were like, you don't need to know that. <laughs> You know, this is my own parents. I mean, now yeah. they obviously did tell me at some point, but you know, when we were younger, they were like, you yeah, know, that's not for public consumption. And isn't that interesting, right? I mean, that I can't imagine. I mean, as soon as you meet someone, pretty much now, they know you know which side they're on. You know, the, most people are going to tell you in one way or another, um, and and they know they're telling you. They may not say I'm. A Democrat or I'm a Republican, but they're telling you, right? Um, and and it's it's very interesting that that we've had that real shift from hey, you know what, I'm an American versus I'm a one party or the other, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that that's kind of funny. I, I had a friend who um, she's American and she married a guy who. Um, is Israeli and he grew up on a kid's kibbutz. And when she, when she met him, he said, um, you know, so like are you into politics or whatever? Yeah, well, you know, sure, whatever. And, you know, they have this little conversation and comes up, well, she says, so, so what are you? And he says, I'm a capitalist. I'm like, wow, that's, that's quite an answer, right? That's, that is framed from growing up on a kibbutz, right? <laughs> you yeah. know, and, and she said, gosh, I was so taken aback. I expected him to say a Democrat or a Republican, you know, cause he's now an American, you know? And um, I thought, well, that, that's an interesting way of putting it, right? I mean, do we say we're an American or do we say, you know, a capitalist or do we say a socialist or do we say, you know, how do you describe yourself even in your own head? You know, how do you describe yourself? Um, and it, like one of my kids came home and he had to do a, uh, a project and he had to have three cultural backgrounds from, from his history. And, and like, he was like, I don't know. I, I mean, I put an American flag. I'm American. I was like, good for you. Great. I don't think that's what the teacher meant, but okay. Like now where can we go from there? You, he's like, well, I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm like, okay, let's go with Pennsylvania. Like that's what you think of. And that, you know, he's not thinking, you know, gosh, where did my ancestral roots come from? You know, <laughs> he's thinking, yeah. well, culturally, you know, what am I? You know, and he's, thank goodness, too young to say I'm a, you know, whichever party. Um, but I thought, boy, that was a really, um, maybe really stop and think and, and maybe think, gosh, I, I hope more kids, I hope more kids are thinking this. And I hope that the teacher is kind of like, oh, huh, this is how they're thinking about it. Um, because it, it was, it was, I think, refreshing. 
um, at least for me to hear that. I don't know what the other what the other kids did, but I was like, gosh, I'm glad you I'm glad you first reaction was culturally you're an American. Great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> let's yeah. let's keep that for a while. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you, you, I think one of the things that gets I think also lost in discussions or the thinking about America is like we forget how huge the country is, like how in terms of space and in terms of the number of people, we're like the fourth largest in, by, I think, area and the third largest by population, I think. And that's huge. So the fact, I think the fact that there I mean, the fact that maybe there would be either a lots of different interpretations of what it means to be American or the fact that people wouldn't even actually think of themselves as American first isn't necessarily surprising. And I, But I think the other thing that I, I think that makes the country unique is that really the United States is the first country that was really based on an idea. Right. It's not really we had, there is no ethnic connection to it. It was it, it wasn't sui generis because like, you know, there was obviously there was Native Americans here, but there was an, a, a conglomeration of lots of different people that kind of settled here and said, OK, the United States, what is it? So I think the fact that it is really an idea means that that definition of what is an American is always up for grabs, right? Like if you're Chinese, you're Chinese. If you're Italian, you're Italian. I mean, obviously there's nuances in terms of geography, but like to be American is such a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a such a dynamic term that in some respects it's a privilege to live in a country where when people ask you what's your culture or heritage, you can say, I consider myself American, I consider myself Pennsylvanian, or I consider myself Chinese American, or whatever it is. I think right, right. in that respect, the debate about identity in our country kind of makes sense because it isn't just you're American. It's not dogmatically imposed on you that you are American, right? Like, what, right. what does that mean? Like, that's a totalitarian state as well to kind of impose that. But I think that what we do need is more maybe celebration or reminders of the fact that we are one country um, right, that right. maybe is disparate. But we, I think we need more reminders of, of that, of, of what, yeah. what, is, what does keep us together. Right. And, and you know, I, I think you, you're dealing with this somewhat with the travel arm of your business or your um, organization. But um yeah, you know, we we try to take our kids a lot of different places. And <laughs> a couple summers ago, we ended up out west, and we went to uh, what I always thought was a rodeo, but it's a rodeo. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> um, and it was so fun and so different. And um, you know, it, it you know, we're walking around ahead of time, and you can like ride the bull or the mechanical bull, or you know, pet the animals, and you know, uh, see the horses and buy a cowboy hat and and you know we had a great time we had no clue what we were doing um and the, the it was it you know it, it, i guess it was a, a one that runs very frequently at maybe every night or something for the summer and so the um mc was used to having i guess 50, apparently 50 percent were tourists 50 percent were locals every every night so he would tell us what was going on um while on horseback he was on horseback the whole time doing this broadcast and he knew everybody's name and whatever the events were and it was so fascinating and and we all enjoyed it and after i said you know like that's not something that you're going to get without going out and seeing other parts of the country and that's important you know hey that person's you know ordinary um daily life includes rodeos right for us it was an adventure <laughs> you know like the things that we do that might be ordinary daily life would be unusual to them you know so remember that you know remember that you know maybe something that seems so obvious and so not debatable to you if you came from somewhere else within the states might be very very debatable um and you don't see that if you don't go search it out either you know going to different places or trying to find different um you know information on technology aside from whatever your mainstream media tilt is um yeah. you know and I, I think it takes work um but it's worth it's worth doing yeah you, the um the, the other thing inside for me in, in terms of thinking about the country is uh, and, and you actually you're in a perfect area where th this is probably most obvious for America is that there's different depths of history, 
Like, in other words, like you, you live in, outside Philadelphia, right? That's an established, important city for centuries. And American speak, America speaking, right, right. whereas <laughs> if you go out west, I mean, there, there might be a couple of generations removed from being frontier, right? Like Philadelphia was a frontier like hundreds of years ago, whereas for people out west, you know, it was grandpa settled this area or homesteaded or whatever it is, whereas for you, you know, it goes back so much farther. So I think that's another um, dimension in which there is uh, a variety in the country, more so than almost any other place in the in the world. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, um, you know, you, you recognize that. You recognize that people have different perspectives. Um, I think that's the trick, right, to realize that, um, you know, even if you are my neighbor, you know, my neighbor, I think, you know, moved here from the Midwest and doesn't have any roots here. So it's a very different point of view than, you know, I walk down the street and I could very well bump into one of my parents. I could very well bump into someone I went to school with from kindergarten, you know, um, which is a very different experience. Um, and, um, you know, kind of recognizing that. You know, and just yeah. I, I think that that's um, that's very important for people to to know and to see. And um, you know, we are going to be naturally drawn to people who think like us. You know, it's comfortable. Um, but it's one thing when you're an adult and you do that. But I think it's interesting when you're in situations with younger people. You know, kids, middle schoolers, high schoolers, um, college. You know. I, I say like, you know, you want to be able to respect other people, whatever they think. Um, and you want them to be able to respect you. You don't want to be shut down the minute you open your mouth because they hold a different opinion um, or vice versa. You know, so I, I think that gets tricky with younger kids, you know, younger people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I think on the other hand, and I don't know, but I feel like when I think back to Penn, I don't remember being really very conscious one way or the other about which way people voted or thought yeah. about the world. I mean, maybe it was yeah. just because everybody was thinking about where they were going to get a beer or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or it backpack to us. Europe, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, you know, or, or where's my source of caffeine to study for all-nighters? But I don't right, remember right. that being so prevalent either. And I feel like maybe as you get older – we're all settled. I mean, and maybe this has always been the case, but we've all like kind of settled in to, you know, to your, to your own like world. And, and I think that, you know, in, in some respects, I think that, uh, people will look back at different points in history and be like, well, you know, if, if, you know, World War II, we can never have fought if the, the, you know, like if we can't do the fight, the pandemic or whatever it is, people will equate it to something else. But I'm like, you know, it's, everything is a totally different circumstance. Right. And right now we, we are empowered with a certain, with a technology and with an interconnectedness that people in prior generations didn't have. And that comes with its own opportunities, which I think is why like, I'm trying to do the podcast. And it comes with its own challenges. And, and we all have to learn how to take advantage of the good points and, and maybe tamp down the, the bad the, 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 the bad points. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting because, like, for instance, um, AI, you know, that, that's sort of like top on everybody's mind, you know. Yeah. I mean, as a patent attorney, we're supposed to be cutting edge, you know. And, right. Um, we've looked into it and and we're looking at you know the technology we're saying like yeah we can see there's going to be a lot of benefits but you got to you got to like be careful you got to mm -hmm. you got to weigh you know what are the detriments what are the you know the things that you know how you know how how could what are the downsides you know how could mm -hmm. this work against you we've got clone attorney client privilege we've got those kinds of things so maybe we need to you know, kind of tamp this down so that it doesn't get used in, you know, some other form that the AI now knows, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, those are the challenges, but they're also the benefits of, of leaving, of living now. Um, and I think, I think we can do it. You know, I mm -hmm. think it's just a matter of people saying, you know, hey, I, I don't want our country to, you know, not do well. I want it to do well. And so how do I, as, you know, an American, um, do my part? You know, how do I, you know, 
you know, not create a rift? How do I listen to other people? How do I speak to other people? Hopefully people, other, other people will listen to me when I have something to say. Um, and, you know, and, and go out and find out more. Because I always say, you know, knowledge is power to my kids. You know, hey, go mm -hmm. find out more. If you don't know enough, go find out more. Um, you don't have to go to the library. You don't need the encyclopedia yeah. anymore. You know, <laughs> you yeah. can go right online and go find it, you know, um, or go down the street and talk to somebody else. You know, don't don't just be in your own head. Um, and I think, um, yeah, that we have great opportunities, but um, we have to use them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the frustrating thing to me is like a, a lot of times I feel like they, the incentives become very kind of one way. So in other words, like, I, I, like, you know, to me, if you look at, you know, say, you know, from manufacturing in the United States, like the, the numbers would have said, okay, let's just move everything someplace else because it's cheaper and the market pushes it that way. And then you all of a sudden have lots and lots of people who don't have jobs and lots and lots of towns and communities that just kind of get ravaged. And where is what or is there any market incentive to repair the damage that's done there? It's kind of like um, like what I see is like, you know, Facebook can come up with a thousand ways to like attract advertisers. But in terms of trying to fix the um, what are they called? The uh, uh, the. Uh, I forget the word, but the problems that their technology creates, all of a sudden their hands are tied. Yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting. I, I think, though, you know, one of the interesting things that came out of the pandemic is that people were like, oh, my gosh, I couldn't get anything because it was made in China. And we couldn't ship anything from China or China wasn't working or, you know, um, do we, you know, a lot of um I was just reading about precious metals that we need for things like computers and iPhones and, you know, next generation of cars, et cetera. Um, do we want that to be something that we go overseas for? And I think a lot of people are saying, Hey, that's not smart, right? That is, that's not smart. And the, hopefully we'll start to see some, and I do think we've seen some, um, you know, rebound. Uh, hey, you know, I want that made in the USA. Yeah. You know, I want, I want those jobs here. I don't want those jobs there. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I think hopefully people will remember that and remember that strategically um, that's not good for us, but also economically, that's not great for us. Right. I mean, if, if something needs to get made, um, you know, sometimes it might make sense to go overseas, but sometimes it makes sense to keep it here and pay the people here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a, it's it's there's the ideals and then there's the reality and um, I, I think maybe the the for, it'd be it's good for all of us to maybe start appreciating yeah. that there there's you know there, the ideal is something that is the ideal for a reason it's not really attainable and not practical. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not. I mean, it's an ideal, but on the other hand, you got to think about it when you're making your practical decisions. Right? right, right, yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, in terms of like thinking about like manufacturing, you could easily picture like the idea of like mining and be like, oh, the environment, damage to the environment and this and that. But like, you've got to balance lots of different things, not right, just right. your and, own and, singular and, interests. I mean, I, I will say, you know, I have, depending on what it is, sometimes bought things because they were made in the USA, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, especially when we're thinking about like, Go, moving forward with technology, um, maybe that's really, really, really important. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, you, you don't think you have any secrets, but when you know a, a, an enemy country knows all about you and starts, you know, hacking into your feed, you might feel differently. Um, you know, so you, not to play too, you know, crazy um, paranoia here, but you know, I, I, I think it's worth considering. You know, where are things coming from and and who has it? And, um, you know, who, where did, who's going to have access to either the money that you spent or the uh, control the, the goods or control the information that you gave? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you had said we should, you probably had that. We're probably near the end of your, <laughs> your window. <laughs> <laughs> Although, and we just got started. Like I was hoping I just to go on a discourse about Pennsylvania, but that's why I kind of <laughs> start with an open-ended question just to see where it goes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so well, uh, <laughs> Pennsylvania is great. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you get all? Have you gotten all over Pennsylvania in your life, or do you usually spend more time just in the southeast? You know, it's funny. Um, 
you know, you hear the the joke about, you know, Pennsylvania, right? You know, Pennsylvania is Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Kentucky in between. And, you know, I grew up in Philadelphia, so, or around Philadelphia. So I view, you know, my area, not as so much Pennsylvania, but, you know, like the greater Philadelphia area. Um, I was an adult before I ended up in Pittsburgh. I, sorry, Pittsburgh people who are listening, but, um, <laughs> you know, it was like another world. It's just, it's far away. And um, I don't know, that just wasn't a place that I went. And, you know, one of the things that I noticed when I went to Pittsburgh, maybe the first couple of times was, um, you know, how different things were when you get out of the suburbs of both Philadelphia and, and Pittsburgh. Um you know, I, I guess I've gone skiing and things like that, um, you know, and the Poconos and things. But when I when I think of traveling, I don't normally think of traveling per se in Pennsylvania. It's more like, let's go somewhere else and see something different where we probably could find something pretty different, um, you know, not too far away um, yeah. in Pennsylvania as well. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, Marilyn, I'd like to uh, I guess wrap up the conversation by asking, like, what, what gives you hope at the end of the day? Yeah, I've been thinking about that. Um, so I think for me, um, so I am Catholic, and I get a lot of hope from my faith. Um, I really believe, um, you know, that you need to work hard and do what you can do with, you know, what God's given you. Um, and then, you know, things will um, happen for reasons. So um, you know, I'm not always Zen-like um, in, in terms of how <laughs> things have happened or, or going to happen. But I, I do think there's, you know, overall, um, you do your best. And sometimes things aren't what you want, but you know, God has a plan. So I kind of come back to that. And I, I kind of look at that and say, you know, if I can um, believe in that and, and try and live my life as best I can that way and pass it on to my children, I'm hopeful um, that, you know, that, that would be a positive influence in their lives and in, you know, young, you know, the younger generations, I think, um, you know, I, I draw a lot from, from my faith. So, um, you know, I guess that's probably not something you hear from a lot of people. Um, and I don't normally talk a lot about it. Um, but I do think, um, you know, it has given me a lot of, um, peace and and you know way of a way of living my life and and i think that um you know if i can lead by example and and pass that along i think that that um you know gives me a lot of hope for how things will will move on um even you know after you know after me mm. well thank you appreciate that um, and I thank you for making time for this conversation. It's been a real pleasure to have the, the chance to catch up with you like this. Well, it's great to talk to you, Michael, as always. And, um, you know, it's, it's always interesting to listen to your podcast. So I can't wait to, to hear the next one. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, thank you to the listeners and viewers out there. May you go out and explore our country with curiosity, respect, compassion, and humility. All right. Thanks so much, Marianne. Bye-bye.